Okay. So, um, people will join us gradually as we go, but I'm here with Oli Zeidler, 23 years old, and the 2019 European Single Skulls Champion, 2019 World Single Skulls Champion. It it was an amazing year for you, 2019, Oli. Yeah, hi, Martin. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, definitely. 2019 was the most successful year of my sports career and, um, of course, my rowing career yet. Um, and I'm very pleased with the results, winning the Europeans, the Worlds, and Henley was uh, great. These are one of my... Uh, this had been my goal since I started uh, to race competitively in rowing. So, uh, yeah, I'm pretty happy. That's pretty good. And and you look pretty happy at the moment. It's all quite strange circumstances all over the world. But um, I gather you've just been into work this morning. Yeah, correct. Um, I'm still working um, in a tax consultancy at Deloitte. Um, so I do it three, uh, three days a week. And... Uh, yeah, I think it's quite good because of the circumstances to have got something to do next to training, even if it's not that uh, performance focused in training at the moment. So you have got something to do for your brain as well. Yeah, and Deloitte have been pretty good to you, haven't they? They've, they've looked after you as a sponsor as well as um, an employer. Yeah, I'm with them for five years now. So I started right after school um, to work for them. Um, and did a dual um, university degree with them. So I worked next to my studies um, with them. And now they are supporting me in rowing so I can com uh, so I can compete in rowing championships and do my training next to the job. So they are very yeah. supportive, of course. Yeah. yeah. Are you quite clever then? Uh, yeah, that's what uh, people have to have to say. I, I don't want to say that I'm clever. <laughs> But I think I heard your mom. There's a great film that um, that the TV guys have been doing about the scholars in Germany, and I think your mum was saying that you were very, you were a very, very active child at school and a very bright child at school. Yeah, that's correct. Um, I was uh, some kind of a troublemaker always uh, <laughs> in school. So um, yeah, I think you can be happy that you haven't been my teacher. <laughs> wow. But I bet you, I bet your teachers are proud of you now. Yeah, they are. They are definitely proud of me. Um, I also um, send a, a uniform uh, with my signature on it um, to the school where my sister is now. So it is the same school as I was, um, and they are very proud, of course, to have got such a uh, alumni. Oh wow! So Marie, Marie, is it Marie Sophie? Was she at the same no, school? It's, um, it's Leah. It's Leah. It's the oh, Leah. younger sister. I've got two younger sisters. Yeah. Oh wow! Oh, that's amazing. So, um, what I we were chatting just beforehand, and um, people won't realise. I certainly didn't realise that there are three generations of Zeidlers who live in the same house. Out is it in Erding? Yes, it's a. Uh, it's close to Erding. It's between Erding and the Munich airport. Um, that's where we live. Um, in a house together with my grandparents. My grandparents are the Fairbas, uh, so, and so these are my mother's um, parents, and then, of course, my parents, and then the three children, and two dogs living under one house. Yeah. Two dogs. How come, how come you all live together? That's um, quite unusual for a family to live together. Yeah, I think we have got a really good relationship. So my parents decided to stay with my uh, mother's parents. Um, and when I um, when I was born, they decided to move in a bigger house. This is the house we are where we now live in. And yeah, it stayed the same. So is your is your your grandfather was an Olympic champion, Johannes Faber? In yeah. Munich. I've seen that race. I think you can still maybe watch it on YouTube, possibly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So did he have his Olympic – did you always know your grandfather as an Olympic champion? Did he have his medal around the house? Um, yes, I know where it is. Um, it's in a um, cabin in the living room, so um, you can actually see it if you look very close, but he's not uh, showing it around or something like this. It was yeah. when I was a child, he was always um, telling me about his um, experience at the Olympics. And that's how my Olympic dream 
de developed and then of course i always wanted to have a look at his uh, gold and the bronze medal uh, from the olympics and uh, yeah it's it's pretty amazing as a young child and i think it's also pretty special to um that the olympic dream develops in such a young age yeah, yeah. It, mu it, mu it must have been so inspirational and i guess not just not just for for you but for your dad growing up because your dad took up the same sp your, the same sport yeah my uh, my dad was also always streaming uh from the olympics uh and unfortunately he never made it in one year um the um coaches told him that he's just too young to go to the olympics even if he had the um the power and the um results he needed to compete there um yeah it was very unfortunate but now we are pursuing the goal together and maybe i can make his uh, his olympic dream come true uh, when i can finally go there in 2021 yeah, we'll talk of that a little later because I, I one thing that surprised me. Um, so we'll 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 talk about the twenty nineteen races and season. But um, I I did see that that semi final. I hadn't realised how important the semi final in Linz was for you because you yeah. qualified for the Olympics. Yeah, this was uh, a very very special moment. I just after the race, I just needed wanted a few uh, minutes just for myself. Just um enjoying this moment because uh, as a swimmer i haven't made it to the olympics in 2016 um and uh yeah i worked hard in the last years to make this uh dream come true so finally i've got the qualification which was yeah actually <clears throat> after the semi-final when you qualified for the a final of the singles uh this was just mind-blowing it's wow. still one of the nicest um yeah feelings i ever had in my life yeah really wow. so ollie you you did try to qualify for the 2016 olympics as a as a swimmer or you had dreams of doing that uh, i had dreams and i pursued this dream as well but um yeah i haven't uh made it in the end unfortunately so um People, were, I know your story is, is quite well told about how you were first a swimmer and then you changed to rowing, but um, maybe people don't quite understand why somebody from a rowing family with their grandfather's Olympic medal in the house from rowing um, decided to turn to swimming. So how, how young were you when you took up swimming and why was that? Um, I think I was seven years old when I started to swim. Um, in a few years, years later, I also started to play basketball for one year, but um, around 12, 11, 12, um, I had to decide which sport I want to do to become competitive. And in the end, it was swimming and I was quite successful there. So even when I tried to row and uh, capsized after two strokes, I told my family that this doesn't make sense. I am currently very good uh, in another sport. So um, I will stay in the water instead of on the water, and uh, yeah, they they supported me in this in my way, even as a swimmer. My grandfather and my dad um, also went uh, to to morning sessions in swimming with me before school when I was uh, in in school in Erding because I wasn't yeah. able to um, drive to Munich in the morning and then back to Erding to school. So <clears throat> yeah. I'm happy that I have a family who was supporting me, even if I was not a rower, and yeah. now even more. What did you like about swimming training? Because, you know, I I haven't done a lot of swimming, but I kind of think it's just looking at the bottom of a pool for a long, long time. And um, I don't quite understand the motivation, but I think maybe moving through water or something. What did you like about swimming training? Um, well, um, it's very hard training as well as rowing. Um, you definitely have to do a bit, you have to do, uh, spend a lot of time in the water just to stay in, in this feeling because you really lose the water feeling if you haven't been in the water for two days. So this is always, uh, you, you want to stay in on, on a high level. And, uh, this is where the team plays an important role because, um, the team in Munich, this was uh, really the best time of my life when I um, just had fun with the guys in training. 
And uh, we had got some sessions where I just had to laugh the first 50 meters um, of a intensive session because of the trash talk we had before. This is <laughs> this is a time I don't want to miss. And yeah, I'm pretty happy that uh, it went that way. So your training group, I know, because one of the reasons that I, I've sort of read that you stopped swimming was that your training group disbanded or ended. Yeah, this was the this was the main reason. Uh, we had got three Olympic um, participants. Uh, we have got uh, two yeah. Olympic yeah, um, of the 2016 Olympics, and all of them decided to um, to retire from swimming. And then we had got a few other guys who um, hadn't made it, like I am. So uh, yeah, the whole team wasn't that competitive on one side anymore. And uh, on the other hand, there was not the fun left which we had before. So um, it was a bit difficult. I decided to um, swim for three more months then, then um, announcing that the German short course championships will be my last um, competition in November 2016. And then uh, swimming was, uh, I was also retiring from swimming. You know, one thing that I thought when I was watching that that clip was that, you know, single sculling, and I know you're you're pretty much by yourself. We're talking, you know, if you, if you do more things um, with other people later on. But mm -hmm. I thought he stopped because he enjoyed this training group and the, the motivation. Mm -hmm. But then he kind of went to a situation where he didn't have a training group. He was just by himself. So I thought that was quite a big change. And... Yes, that's correct. This was quite a bit, uh, big change. Um, I still went to uh, weightlifting training with the swimmers, indeed, oh. after, uh, even when I retired. But um, yeah, it was the situation here in Munich. Um, I wanted to be trained by my father. The clubs here in Munich didn't want that. So um, the only chance for me was to row in a single. I learned rowing in a single. I stayed in a single. And yeah, this, this is how it developed. So I became a single scholar. So, are you quite stubborn as well? Uh, no, not really. I wouldn't say it. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> okay, so when you said you wanted to be trained by your father, because I, what your your father wasn't a professional rowing coach. I know he'd been an international rower, but mm -hmm. why did you want to be trained by your father? Um, we hadn't got a lot of time during my um, swimming training times because I had to leave the house very early. Um, after after school to um, drive to training in Munich and then I came back about um, 10 p.m. So in the end I had got maybe 10 minutes with my father and my parents or my family um, every day. So um, I thought this is a good chance to um, power up our relationship again. Oh, and cool. so um, I really enjoyed the time with my father then just uh, being uh, on the Oberschlesheim course and uh yeah having good training this was uh, what i wanted and that's why i decided this way and how did your how does your dad know how to coach i mean it's all very well having been an international rower but to learn how to coach i mean where did he get that experience or did he did he go on some courses or did he talk to some people um i think he had some chats with my grandfather um, my grandfather was um, coaching during his active time indeed and also after that um, he was also the coach of my father for a few years so um, oh. I think there are some uh, there came some inspiration and uh, insights and my dad always had a had an idea how my rowing sh stroke should look like <laughs> and uh, that's uh, how all um develop the way it, it it is now yeah yeah so um just there are some people tuning in ollie one one lad kent nord um it's it's kind of maybe jumping forward a little bit but he's asked um who you think your toughest opponent might be in the olympic games of 2021 um that's a good question um i think the toughest opponents will be the medalists from this year's world champ indeed uh, so sweary and chattel um they developed pretty well last year um and we had a very strong competition of course at the world championships you all know um this final this was really close and i think everyone in this final had the chance to become world champion 
And um, they are also in an age where one year more isn't that decisive <coughs> uh, compared to other older guys. So um, I have got these two definitely on my list, but a few more. You know, the single sculling fields, um, there are about 10 people, I would say, who are able to medal in Tokyo um, if it happens. And yeah, it will be very interesting to watch. That's crazy, isn't it? And um, and, and I know that you are in contact. Um, I mean, there is this idea of the, the brotherhood of single scholars, that it's very close and people have really good relationships that race each other in the single skulls. Yeah, that's right. I think um, we are indeed good friends um, beside the time between Attention Go and the... Uh, Serene at the, at the finish, um, but uh, yeah, we are really close. We are good friends. We are, uh, have got a good connection, and yeah, uh, yeah it's it's a, I would say it's a, like an exclusive club where you have to qualify for to become <laughs> one of the singer scholars. Yeah, yeah. Um, did you mind they threw you in the water at the end of the race at the uh, after the medal ceremony? Uh, yeah, and this was uh, also very special. <laughs> I noticed you held your medal. Yeah, I was uh, I was aware that it might uh, just uh, um, fl fly away. Yeah, yeah. Like like the sunglasses of Sverry, I think, or kettles. Some sunglasses also uh, fall into the water in this action. <laughs> so, um, just one of the questions that I, I think I found hard to understand and I think it's part of your story is that you seem to learn how to be in a single skull ridiculously quickly very very fast in terms of you 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 change you started in 2016 and then by 2018 you were already a world cup medalist and that seems to break all the rules that that many people understand about how long it takes to learn yeah, um, as I said, I had got very personal training, of course. I had got my dad, who was only watching me. Um, I'm someone, if you tell me something, I try to um, change the technical uh, details immediately. So we had got really good steps forward in every training. So it was uh, actually fun just to just to see and feel this development of becoming safer in the boat, um, developing the stroke length and everything. And yeah, it, it was a big motivation for me. And this is how, how it all worked out. And of course, swimming was also helping me because it's it's the same idea in the end because it, they, they are both water sports. So you want to reach out with your arms or with the blades and then pull it through the water without uh, just putting the maximum effort on it, but to move uh, in an effective way through the water. Yeah. And this is how, what you, what you learn in swimming too. So this was a big advantage for me as well. So do you, do you think you were able to be more sensitive in the sculling boat on, particularly on the catch because you knew how the water were, it worked in a, in the water when you were swimming? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's the same idea of, uh, of moving your body or the boat forward, definitely. Yeah. Um, Kingsley Paul has asked, he, he wants to know what the most difficult training is, whether it's swimming training or sculling training. Uh, well, uh, in swimming, I was always a sprinter, so more short distances. So for me, it was hell to uh, swim for 800 or 1,500 meters. <laughs> um, in rowing, it's it's the challenge of a 2K race or 2K pieces in training. If you do it really uh, on a maximum level, you uh, feel how your body is is fighting. And uh, yeah, I would say that's uh, about a session like three times 2,000, which we do regularly uh, in the boat, is one of the hardest things you can do. Oh, tell, tell me about that session, Ollie. Is that three times 2,000? Or what, what kind of pace is that at? Um, well, we do it with uh, rate restrictions and on the first two, so um, becoming more um, a higher and higher rate. So from 30 to 32, then 32 to 34, and the last one is open rate, where you just try to um, to reach a, a good time in the end. Yeah. Oh wow! And um, yeah, 
um, so it, um, if you um, if you started your your learning to single skull, how long before you made your first race? Um, when I started in September. I think um, the first race was in June 2017. It had been the German small boat champs for the U23s. Um, my goal, when I when I started to row and with my father, our goal was to be ready for the Bavarian State Championships in this year. But then we realized that uh, uh, in the, on the Munich course will be the German Championships, so we signed oh, in no. for this race. And this is where... Um, when was my, where my first outing was in in the in the singer sculling and I became third and the national team coaches were a bit upset because they hadn't seen this coming of course and they said uh, she said that um, they can't put me in a boat for the world championships because I haven't had the uh, previous qualification regattas but I will get a chance to race at the U23 Europeans then in the single. And that's where I modeled as well uh, about, I think, two or three months later. Yeah, with, yeah. With the second place. The second place in those. And, and you, you mentioned there, one of the interesting things about you is the relationship that you um, and, and I guess your dad as, as your coach um, have with the German Federation. How, how would you describe it? Because... Um, I know that they have a sculling set up and they like to have it all close together and you don't yeah. fit into that model. Um, well, it's uh, it's because of many reasons that I haven't moved to Hamburg where our German sculling, men's sculling center is. Uh, one hand was my uh, university, of course, together with uh, the work at Deloitte um, and also my family background here in Munich. I think the development which we had in the last years hadn't been that uh, positive if I had moved to Hamburg or to any other team because there was not this personal um, uh, yeah, yeah, personal yeah. training uh, yeah. for me, uh, which I need, of course, in the first years when you want to learn sculling pretty well, you really need someone who is looking at you all the time. Um, and that's why I haven't moved to Hamburg. I just wanted to make sure that my my bubble here, which is all set for for success in in a work relationship and in a training and a competitive rowing relationship, um, stays the same. And I think there's no time for some testing one year before the Olympics. Just moving to Hamburg without a clue how it works, going to another coach. Um, this doesn't make sense. So we decided yeah. to uh, that I will stay here in Munich. Um, and then the um, the answer from the Federation was, okay, if you want to stay in Munich, you only can be in the single, nothing else. And so I set everything on the single skull list um, and try to yeah. be, be the best, uh, try to um, win every race so nobody can say something that I'm, I could be out of the team. And this is how... It all worked out last year. It, se it seems amazing that, and and in the first in 2018, just after you you had not long started to single skull, you went to your first World Cup, and I mean it it was in Belgrade. I remember that race very well. You mm -hmm. you you nearly beat Andre Sinek, I think, and um, was it Roman Ruizli, the Swiss sculler, in second yeah. place? Uh, but it was so close, and people. Yeah. People couldn't believe this big, tall guy they'd never seen before on the rowing circuit, and here he was with a World Cup medal. Yeah, this was this is one still one of my favorite moments of uh, of rowing because this was the moment where I realized that I can actually be competitive on a world class level in the sport, which was surprising for me because one year after starting to row, beating one of the role models uh, in single sculling um, for on the 1,500 meter Andre Sinek. This was, uh, I just had a smile on my face after 1,500 meters because my dad just told me, you haven't been in, in the lead this, this weekend uh, yet. So you just try to um, get, get on terms with the others and try to be in the lead uh, as long as you can. And that's what I did. And this was just fantastic. And after the race, 
so many people came there and said yeah. I, had, I had goosebumps uh, all over my body because this was this was a magical moment for rowing when you when you came along there and yeah this was very inspiring and motivating for me of course yeah and and people know uh, one thing about you because you're you're a, a very tall man and um you you are very naturally very strong on the rowing machine on the ergometer um yeah you can say that i never had a um 2000 meters uh over six minutes so even when i started to uh with erg training the first 2k was uh five five fifty fifty two something like this so oh. i've got some uh some power or some um yeah talent in me to move fast on the rowing machine <laughs> Can I can I try and just maybe uh, th I've got the last bit of a clip of you on the rowing machine. I think you you pulled a five forty three. Yeah, um, this was last week for yeah. the um, concept spring challenge or something like this. So this was a team event, and I had to go for a two thousand meter in the last oh. week. So this was pretty hard. So Ollie, let me just see if I can share the screen and yeah. um, and see if. Uh, Yeah, there we go. Maybe you can talk talk through this. This is, I think, the last minute of you on the machine. Yeah. Yeah, my dad shouting. He was all with me through the 2K. People think you row longer on the rowing machine than you do in the single. You get more compression. Um, yeah, we worked on this through winter. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm pretty happy now. We had got some uh, changes on the setting on the boat as well, and yeah, unfortunately, we are not able to test it on a uh, on a World Cup level or something like this against the other guys. But uh, I think uh, this is uh, another improvement in the right direction for me. You look to be suffering now, Ollie. Yeah, after after three weeks where you only have had uh, five sessions because uh, we haven't been focusing on the um, performance because of the postponement of the Olympics. Uh, it's not the best idea to start with a 2K work <laughs> then because this is really hard, of course. Oh. Ouch. So, um... What are you allowed to say? What your best two K ergo score is? Um, yes, you can see it on my Instagram. It's five thirty eight point six. And when did you do that? Um, I think it's about two years ago, when I uh, concentrated more on the erg and less on the rowing. And oh. uh, this is a um, advantage, of course. I think when you um, concentrate on on the erg for more. Uh, a bit more, you can actually um, yeah. drop your drop your best times a lot. So, so one uh, one Chris Leonard asked me to ask you um, if you ever think you might have um, a, a go at breaking the world ergometer record for two k. Yeah, one day um, I think this is uh, this is a goal for me, but not before the Olympics because before oh. the Olympics it's something you. You should concentrate on rowing. This maybe this year there had been a good chance, but with the Europeans now coming up, maybe um, it's again more rowing concentrated, so on the water mm. and less uh, erg sessions. Yeah. Yeah. I, I saw an interview with you before the Olympics were cancelled that you you thought you might not the Olympics wouldn't be cancelled. You thought it might still carry on. Uh, what impact did the cancellation of the Olympics have for you? Um. Well, in the first moment, it was a shock because uh, the IOC just communicated with us athletes that till now the Olympics will be held as planned. And uh, then within four days, they uh, threw everything away and had a completely other, uh, went in a completely different direction. Uh, this was a bit shocking for me. And um, if when you put some belief in the, in the IOC and what they say, um, it's a bit, uh, yeah, 
it destroys yeah. the the moral and everything. Yeah. yeah. So we hope the Olympics will happen next year. But um, if they if they don't, will you do you still plan to row along to to Paris? Yeah, this is the fixed goal for me. I definitely want to go um, another four years now, and then we will see um, how things work out. Um, but Paris is a is a safe goal for me. Okay, so. Um, I had some some questions. Uh, one of my buddies, Ian McNuff, wanted to know when you have a day off. What what is your what does your best day off look like? What do you do? Um, I think I would go to a lake in summer and just uh, swim a bit. Uh, nothing like training, but just uh, yeah. relaxing. Uh, have good lunch, good dinner, and yeah, meeting friends. This is, this is what my perfect day off would look like. Wow. Do you, do you have many days off? Um, at the moment, yes. <laughs> because of the postponement, that's pretty good. But you uh, can't really meet friends. This is a bit unfortunate. But yeah, uh, yeah I try to spend a lot of time outside, um, do the things I enjoy, doing some ERC competitions, or spend a lot of time in, in my boat because this is just... Yeah, it's it's more than a hobby, I would say, and yeah, trying to to use the time. How how many training sessions do you do in a week, and how do you fit them in with your um, work life? It's it's about twenty four four hours a week with training plus uh, physical therapy and everything. So um, yeah, and then it depends, of course, on the on the time of the season. Uh, in summer, you would do more uh, work in the boat. In the winter, you do more work uh, indoors. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of how, how some scholars will train with other boats quite a lot. You know, if they are in the the training centre, um, and but I see film with you, and you are the only guy on that Olympic course, just training by yourself. How do you motivate yourself to push hard to, to train when it's just you and your, your dad following in the launch? Um, well, this is a pretty um, normal scenery, I would say, because uh, in the morning when I drive to the course, I'm also the only guy out there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's just uh, searching for a good, uh, good ribbon, a good stroke, and uh, just feeling the flow of the boat is very, um, uh, yeah, makes me happy. On one yeah. hand, and on the other hand, um, I I still want to go hard at the moment. So with a, with less training, but uh, I want to gain some speed because this is also fun. This is what I what I like. So um, this is the motivation I have currently. It doesn't have anything to do with any competition or something like this. I just want to uh, do what I what I like, what I love, and yeah, that's it. Maybe maybe this is a good time. I know you put on Instagram your your five hundred meters. Um, yeah, the five, first two hundred. This should be the first two hundred or something like this. Or the first yeah, yeah, yeah. five hundred. Yeah. Um. So, uh, if we maybe have a look at this. Uh, you can talk us through this race, this uh, five hundred, Ollie. Yeah, as you can see, um, I'm alone on the course. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. And sorry yeah, about this was. Oh, it's. Can no. you still see it? Yeah, I can see it. It's not that smooth, but uh, people might uh, look at it via my Instagram. And yeah, it's, it's actually the second fastest 500 I've ever had. The fastest one was before the World Championships last year. Um, and I was pretty pleased because I haven't done a lot of training recently um, and definitely not uh, on such a high rate. Um, and maybe you can see there that I'm a bit a bit longer than in the last years, even with my, my legs push and everything. So, um, yeah, I thought it was a good idea just to share to people what my, what my training development looked like. 
So um, it, it's very good that you share things, Ollie, because sometimes in the British system, in the British squad, um, the rowers are very secretive. The system, they, you know, when they do the uh, ergometer test, they're not allowed to share the scores. Yeah. Um, you remind me a bit of Eric Murray, the guy from uh, the New Zealand pair. Oh, um, that's, a, that's a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, but Eric used to share, and, and I think also Hamish Bond as well, used to share their scores, and people were very interested in that. Uh, what is your mm -hmm. motivation to do that? Well, um, I think there's, there's no secret. Um, so I don't know if the German system is very pleased with me doing this, but, um, yeah, I, I just do it because, uh, as you said, people like to see what the – what the top guys do. I want to see the scores and um, yeah, I don't see a problem if I share them. So, um, yeah, I, I think um, it would be nice to know what, how fast your 500 meters wa was. Um, this was uh, 131. So, oh, that's insane. There was hardly any wind at all. Yeah, it was in, indeed, it was a bit of a headwind. So, um, I might have break uh, broken my um, my old best time, which I said before the World Championships uh, in this race with with actually no wind. What did you go? You haven't gone sub one thirty, have you? Um, uh, maybe a bit a bit down, yeah. But wow. uh, well, yeah, yeah. This was crazy before the World Championships last year. This was just uh, we had uh, racing, um, so test races all two days. And I broke one personal record on my home course after the other. So it was just uh, phenomenal. Yeah. And that's a really big motivation, isn't it? It really helps you with the training. Yeah, it helped me with the training and also with my with my confidence through the World Championships because I haven't been stro stronger in any um, time in my rowing career because uh, I was on top form. So um, there was nothing nothing to yeah. uh, worry be worried about. Um, Telfin Bedo has asked uh, a question. He, he wants to know, in terms of recovery, how do you measure your own fatigue and, uh, and, and increase and to use that to help you increase the volume of your training? Um, well, I, um, we don't do a very, um, very complex. Uh, I think um, I rely on my feeling a lot, um, how I feel. And how um, how much recovery and how much uh, intensity I can give or take from my body. Um, so there's no no numbers I would say where I rely on. It's just my feeling, my personal um, my personal feeling. Yeah, um, and um, so and and the volume that you do is 24 hours a week. And uh, somebody also asked, do you do you train in the swimming pool at all in the winter? Do you cross train? I try to do um, uh, swimming once a week as a cross train for one and a half to two hours um, in the morning before work. This fits quite good because we have got a, uh, a swimming pool just uh, 200 meters from my office. So uh, this is uh, a good way to combine work with training. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. That's almost so. Um, maybe we can take a look at, at um, last year, the season last year. So um, you must have had a good winter training. Did you go on any training camps? Um, yes, I was um, cross-country skiing together with the guys from the German 8. And then we had, um, I think, two training camps. In One was in Italy and the other one was in um, Austria. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so together with the German Federation, and yeah, it was very successful, I would say, just as this season. And then I've I've got some pictures maybe to share with you from. Um, was it your first? Was the first race the Europeans for you in uh, the twenty nineteen season? Um, no, we had the German Championships before, and oh. a pre and a pre race before the German Championships to to. Um, to qualify um, the singer. So we wanted to know who the singer scholar of Germany will be. And they decided to do it in two races. And uh, in the end, I won both of them. Uh, the first race was in Hamburg. I think there's also a video footage on my Instagram. Yeah. Um, for the last 500 meters or so. 
and the other one was in um, in Cologne. And there, um, my father put this video from Cologne also on YouTube, so you can watch it um, full full time. Was that with Hans Gruner and Timo Piontek? With um, I think it was uh, Stefan Krüger, Stefan Timo Piontek, Lars Hartig, yeah. and uh, and Stefan Riemekast was also in the in the mix. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you you must have. Felt good coming to Europeans. I'm going to try and um, <clears throat> show you the picture of you at uh, 500 meters, mm -hmm. if that works. Uh, so here, um, here are you at 500 meters. Can you see that? That's your bow yeah. of. In in front, um, four scholars very close together. Yeah, um, I had a pretty good start there in Lucerne, uh, which might be a bit surprising after the season before, where I wasn't not where I was not the best starter uh, in the field. Um, but uh, we developed the start. Um, I feel a lot more comfortable um, in the starting position now, and uh, even in this race, um, there was also a bit. Uh, big um, improvement and yeah I just pulled like a dog in on the first 500 <laughs> tried to stay on terms uh, in the middle thousand was then a bit surprised about um, the outside lanes um, before the finish line they came up uh, just, just yeah, the, yeah through the thousand just, meters and you're still in front at a thousand meters you've yeah. we've got um, Stefan Breunink Philip Pavuku on this side quite close to you yeah um uh we've got uh Damir Martin the Croatian scholar and um <clears throat> and then yeah, they came up. yeah 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 that's by the boat tents with about uh, 1200 meters gone what happened there um i was a bit recovering for my um for my final sprint i know that i want to want to sprint through the line so i was doing a bit more load and yeah maybe it was a was a mistake but uh yeah that's where I, that's where i said that they the outside lanes came up and actually passed me and yeah that's where i just uh pulled a bit a uh, bit harder again and yeah on the last 250 you hardly ollie you hardly ever look out the boat but i think in the third 500 there i found a shot of you with your eyes just looking across yeah, the lanes on your left, but you're always your head is always straight down the boat. Yeah, because the head is um, is doing the movement in the end. So if you just look crazy right and left, um, I don't think this a your boat will move pretty good. <laughs> this is my yeah, yeah, yeah. my way of thinking. Yeah, so have you with 350 meters to go? Have you started your sprint already? Um. With 350 meters to go, not no. I was trying to stay on terms with uh, Sverry just to keep a uh, half length lead ahead of him. Sverry Nielsen is in the white boat on your yeah. side, yeah. And um, I haven't had uh, more looks to to the left. Um, I was sure that I have not more than half a length uh, to to the top of the field. Um, this is a this is an important mark for me because half a length you you can. You can get in front for half length on the last 250 if you sprint through the other guys. Uh, so yeah, yeah, and there, <laughs> this is very close to the finish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, and I, I think this was a quite good uh, finish sprint. This was very effective, also, and uh, yeah, I brought all my all my power and uh, and mess into the boat there. So this is this was pretty good. And you yeah. enjoyed it. And this, this enjoyed was it. definitely a nice feeling. Yeah, and I enjoyed a lot. And uh, I was uh, pretty happy that Damir was also celebrating for me. We are very, very close friends. So um, oh, yeah. he was really happy that uh, he saw the the first place before my name. So yeah, yeah. this was how, really fun. How come you're close friends with Damir? Um, we had been in uh, America together. To the head of the Charles and Gold Cup in 2018, and yeah, we had been in the same uh, in the same family in Boston, 
uh, together with his with his wife and yeah we had a lot of fun and Damier is actually also uh, talking German and yeah we had a we just had a lot of fun we just spent all the time together in this time in America yeah yeah and, yeah yeah this was just uh, just cool fantastic so um Gabriel, Gabby Obholzer. Um, hi, Gabriel, if you're watching. And he's asked, um, what do you listen to? What music do you listen to when you're in the gym or on the ergo? Um, I like rock music. So um, this is what I normally listen to. Different rock playlists. Um, I try everything out, what I can find on Apple Music. And yeah, that's it. Do you have a favorite song? Um, it's changing all the time. So um, not really. So I just enjoy uh, listening to good music and it's changing from time to time, yeah. Yeah, okay. And do you like watching TV or go to films, things like that? Um, yeah, during the lockdown, I discovered a bit of Netflix. At the moment, I'm uh, watching the, the Last Dance, so the Michael Jordan documentation. Oh, isn't that amazing, that film? Yeah, that is really cool. Um, and I really enjoy it. And there are also some other uh, some other series I like to watch. Okay, so um, after the Europeans, the season uh, didn't maybe follow the direction you thought it would uh, in the races before the World Championships. Yeah, we had got the two World Cups, which hadn't been that successful um, in Poznan. This was um, just before um, I had a chat uh, with my father that we will continue our training program so we will not uh, go down with the with the volume or tapering for this event so um this was the the competition of 2018 i was i was allowed to not perform um, in a medal position this was <laughs> just clear before the race so we were a bit uh, surprised that um i won the heat the quarter and semi final very comfortably but uh in the final there was then <clears throat> nothing to do there was the the end of my fitness level at this yeah at this yeah, stage yeah, yeah 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 no. and then it was a very strange regatta the last world cup in rotterdam with the wind and the time trials yeah it was a bit unfortunate because uh when you start into a race and you have a time trial and you immediately get a get hit by the wind which the guy um, after you, I was the first one because I was set on one um, as the fastest on of my heat, um, which the other one will not get. You you are losing two seconds or something. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. And there had been so many um, so many wins, strong wins during my race. Um, I haven't had a chance, and I think all of the guys know that uh, Chettle is not twenty seconds faster than me, which was the case <laughs> in this uh, in this in this heat. So. I, I think I don't need to say anything more about this uh, yeah. about time trials in Rotterdam. It was no. half an hour with uh, strange and changing winds every minute, so the times had not been comparable at all. Yeah, but at least it allowed you to be a TV commentator with World Rowing. Yeah, this was fun. Uh, they yeah. asked me if I want to do an Instagram uh, takeover, and I asked, uh, and I said I would, uh, uh, I would like to do a um, commentary for yeah. the. For the singer scouts, yeah, and this was this was fun, yeah. Yeah, good. Do you do you have anyone who inspires you in rowing? I know you said you have a very close relationship with Damir, but who who inspires you? Maybe in rowing or in sport, which which figures do you think of or come to mind? Well, in rowing, it's like uh, with music. With me, I always uh, look at people and think, "Wow, this is inspiring me." The first one was actually Rob Bodell in 2000 because he was uh, very strong on the er ergometer like i am so um i looked as, at his finals and semi-finals in sydney and uh, that's when when i started to talk rowing with my father because um mm. we discussed how this guy is making the boat go fast he was also really tall and then we had a look after the next olympics and world championships then olaf tufte came up and uh, with his style and my father said this is the way um, you should transfer the power into the boat. And this is oh. it's really uh, something like a, a mixture of many, many um, single scholars. Yeah, yeah. My technique. 
And at the moment, we are taking a look at my dry style because he has got a very long stroke. This is something uh, we want to improve for me. And yeah, at the moment, um, it's my technique we are looking at and how to combine it with the other techniques we we already um, copied into our system. Yeah, yeah. It's obvious. It's really interesting to hear, you know, how you and your father think about the great scholars out there and use them as inspirations and use them as technical models as well for where you can improve. Yeah, yeah. There's there's also fun. I I love this about rowing. You can do a, a lot of things. You can watch a lot of racing and see the di different techniques. If you have got very close looks, you will also find similarities um, between uh, the races from year to year and see um, what the what the main aspect is, uh, what makes the, this guy win the World Championships in this year and what makes this guy winning the Olympics in this year. So this is pretty, pretty cool and amazing. Yeah. So I want to take us forward to 2019. Um, I've got some photographs of the race again. I'm going to ask you to talk through them. But I think, first of all, in terms of uh, your dad, um, there is on that the film, which I think is on YouTube, is um, your father is talking to you just before the final. Yeah, um, and, of course. Um, I just wanted, it's, you're very close, and maybe you've got some memories of that. Um, if you can see that now. Uh, no, I can see it. Yes. Yeah. So I'm just going to play that again because I think I might have missed the first bit. Yes, Do you do you remember that, Ollie? Yeah, I remember that. Um, it was a. Yeah, it was very motivational. Of course, we have got something from the Rocky Rocky films where he said, "No pain <laughs> in the end." <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Yeah, this footage. Yeah. Um. What, somebody also asked me to ask you. Um. How do you make a successful relationship with your father as coach? Because you know, maybe sons and parents can be maybe like this sometimes. How do you guys make it work together? Um, well, we have got a very good relationship, and I think um, it's a big advantage to have my father as a coach because uh, he knows me well better than every coach could ever know me. So, um, yeah, I think if we don't have this close relationship, this wouldn't work out. And sometimes we have got troubles, of course. We are arguing a, arguing a lot. Um, especially if we have got different ideas and yeah, in the end, it's about a good relationships. This is the, this is the base for, for success and also for yeah. the co cooperation and yeah, and, we now and, have got this project together and yeah. we really call it our project. So, um, we're working on this and it's fun and brings us closer together. As I said before, we have got uh, a lot of time together now. Not like uh, as I was a swimmer when I was a swimmer, so uh, it's a it's a win win situation. So I'm I'm gonna go um, try and share screen again and look at um, your race in. Uh, so this is uh, this is you sitting on the start in in the race in. 2019 it's the call over so they're calling your name in the grandstand so what is going through your head yeah i wasn't hearing the the noise of all the german and austrian people who are uh, who were actually my supporters so this was uh, pretty cool when i watched the race that uh, the the crowd was cheering for me um yeah before the race i have to say that i'm i'm really nervous when i'm at the start line until um the attention go i'm really nervous but as soon as my boat is running, um, it's it's a great feeling, yeah. So there's the red, the red light going, and I think there is you 11 seconds into the race. How was the start for you in that uh, World Championship final? Uh, it was a good was a good start, I think. I was uh, in the mix. Sverry had 
had a better start, of course, but he is always just um, rocketing uh, um, down the course first. But I think he was never uh, more than half length in the league, so right. um, I was in a comfortable uh, position. And, and how, how high did your right does your rating go off the start? Um, I think about 50, 50 strokes a minute. This is where my starting um, road. And then I try to find a, a comfortable pace for me. And uh, a big advantage for me is definitely from the 200 to the 500, there's no uh, there's right. no letdown. So I just try to stay in the starting um, uh, in the starting stroke rate and everything uh, through this period. Um, and then yeah, try so to improve you, through the middle. Do you expect to be in front at 500 meters? Um, I just try to do my best on the 500 meters. I just try to be sub 140 on the 500 meters. This is my uh, this is my goal, and uh, if this is achieved, this is uh, this is a good start. And yeah, so yeah. my start is not only the 100. My start is from the start to 500. This is where I see if my start was good or not. And I remember saying in commentary how relaxed that your face looked and how loose your shoulders looked. And there you go through into the second 500 meters. Yeah, I was very concentrated, of course. Um, and I think in all my racing, uh, you don't see any uh, emotions in my face. So <laughs> <laughs> some some of my friends always uh, make fun about that, how, how nice my smile is. <laughs> <laughs> did you have did you have any idea at this point what a fantastic race it would be i mean i i think uh i said in commentary this is one of the greatest singles races of all time maybe coming through to the last part of the race did it feel yeah. like that um well i was race? i felt pretty good um during the race but about 600 meters in i realized that my that i haven't started my stroke coach so this was a bit of a distraction <laughs> But yeah, it's it was okay. just then um, staying in the race. Don't let anyone um, go through me for a lot of me uh, um, for more than half a length. And yeah, this was the tactic, and I just concentrated on this tactic. And uh, yeah, in the end, it worked out well. So Stefan Bruining on the far side. Um, and he just came through the most uh, amazing. Uh, push in the third quarter from the Dutchman. He he went through Sferi Nielsen, you and you can see Chettle Borsch in the uh, on this side. He is beginning to push through too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the big surprise was Chettle. Um, I was lucky that I had Steff and Sverry um, in the semi, and they had um, similar race plans, like in the final. So I knew that uh, Steff would come through the middle one thousand, um, and I know I knew that I have to um, stay in touch with Ferry because um, he's also a very um, strong finisher. Uh, yeah. So here you are in the third quarter. You're in. Yeah, third there's also the calm look again, like yeah. in the Europeans. And then uh, back in fourth place. Yeah. So were you are you at all worried at this point? Are you just because you're close to Sverry? Is that what you're thinking? Um, um I saw Sverry, but I was a bit distracted by Kettle because he was very far away. I hadn't got him in my um in my eye. Um so I wasn't seeing him very well. Um so I just had a look. Um, saw that I'm now in fourth position, which, which was not good because I definitely wanted a medal in this race. Um, so um, after 1,500 meters, I think, I started to push again. So here you are going through 500 meters. Yeah. And it's Stefan Bruining still in the lead and Chettle Borsch is coming up. Yeah. You can see it in, in the race footage, indeed, that uh, after five uh, with 500 meters to go, my strokes become more more powerful again, so I don't get in the energy um, saving. I'm not anymore in the energy saving mode of the middle thousand. Um, yeah, and then we come closer um, and closer to the finish line, and uh, on the far side, it's getting closer and closer between us three. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> it's crazy. Which bonus is coming too? I mean, I don't know where he's yeah. energy from. 
And then I think with maybe uh, two fifty to go, I you look round. You look. You you had a, a small look outside the boat. Yeah, I had a look um, at Chettel again. I wanted to know uh, which position I am now. Um, and yeah, then I haven't had a look anymore after that. I just uh, tried to use the last forty. I think these these are forty strokes to the finish line, um, just to try to pull as hard as I can and uh, raise the rate. And yeah, that's when we. This you see how how close this is. This is just crazy. Yeah, well. so here you are in the grandstands and you are still in third place. Yeah, this this is when my when my speed improved. I think I started to um, push harder the last uh, ten strokes there, and then I was uh, on a on a on a split. I al already wanted to uh, achieve in the semis, where I was not very pleased with my final sprint, but yeah, just pulling, pulling, pulling. Trying to catch up Sveri. I haven't had a look at Kettle. I didn't know what he will do, but I don't want it to look outside of the boat and lose, I don't know, a hundred of a second or something like this. And yeah, when I crossed the finish line, I was pretty sure that I was in front of Sveri. I had the feeling, even if it was just, I don't know, three hundreds of a second or something like this, yeah, yeah. I was pretty sure that I was in front of Sveri. And I think um, then photo finish came up from both of, for both of us. And uh, on the on the screen there was Norway third, and I just raised my arm without knowing if I actually became world champion. But I was sure I was in front of Sverry, and I saw that um, Kettle is only third. So raised my arm without the res without the official result. But yeah, I, I was just a bit uh, outside of my of my skin after this race. I was just uh, yeah. How how much how much. Did that how much did that race take out out of you? Um, a lot. It's it was not as uh, um, yeah, it was not as hard as a two k erg, but <laughs> it was close to that. Yeah, and um, and then there was uh, a very um, nice moment. I think the the film on YouTube where your father is. Uh, is watching and then you come up to congratulate your dad. Yeah. Yeah, I remember this. That's why that's why I called him a uh, world champion maker. <laughs> <laughs> so, um how how was it being world champion? Have you I know you you watched the race a lot of times just to maybe maybe it was difficult to believe at first hard to take in yeah um i think uh from my perspective there was not uh, a lot of changes it was more like um enjoying the time after winning the world title with the with the people i'm close with this was uh, very touching and also seeing the there are some videos of my of my friends watching this race from the from the top of the regatta house, and uh, just as uh, seeing them screaming when I cross the line and everything without a without a clue what what the actual result is. And when I raised the arm, they are just escalating this race. Yeah. <laughs> this was great, but uh, in the end, I'm still the same person. Even yeah, if yeah. I have one more medal in my uh, in my house now, but uh, yeah. Uh, Peter Haining is listening to us, and Peter Haining, I think, was three times world champion in the lightweight single skulls, and he wanted to know maybe in the last part of that race um, whether you how you felt the boat and whether where did you get the the feeling from to go? Is it in your hands? Is it in your feet? Is it what what is the sensation for you? Um, I'm very sensitive in my hands because this is the connection between the water and me. And um, it might sound crazy, but sometimes I really have got the feeling like my hand is pulling the water through. So the oars are just a, a, a prolongation of my of my hand or something like this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah so okay. that's the main part. And okay. then the second, the second most important part is the is the hips, where you have to get the connection between the the legs and the upper body and arms. Yeah. 
So uh, we were talking. I didn't realise that you had had. You must be one of the only Europeans to have raced this year, and you went to Australia. Yeah, I visited my aunt there for three weeks. Um, had a training camp there. She's uh, she's a trainer, for, uh, a coach for for a school team, and my uncle as well. And uh, as they are both uh, had been competitive rowers and said I should uh, visit them one day, I said, okay, I will do it in 2020 to prepare for the Tokyo Olympics because they had also very hot weather, very um, um, very humid um, climate. Yeah. So um, I used this, uh, this chance and trained there for three weeks. And in the last week, we had got the state championships there and yeah, I had got two very good races um, in Penrith on the Olympic course, which was also cool. And yeah. yeah, it was fun. Wow, that's amazing, o Ollie. I think we're coming to towards the end of our of our time now. I know you've got um, a chance to go to the gym this afternoon because the gyms are now open for the first time in Germany. Um, yeah, since Monday. So there's my uh, third weightlifting session this week. Uh, I have to, uh, I have to gain some muscles again. Wow, you look, you look very strong. I have to say, your English is amazing, Ollie. It's so. No, thank you, Martin. We're perfect. Um, I've so much enjoyed talking to you, and I think uh, a lot of people will love watching this film and and uh, understanding your mentality, which you've been very open, and which is wonderful to see someone in the world of rowing be be so open and willing to share things because it's so motivational to everyone who watches yeah i hope so and i really enjoyed the time with you and yeah hopefully we'll see you on the regatta course soon again okay so ollie take care have a good time this All afternoon the best. and see you later All bye the best.